Welcome everyone. In this video lecture, we will tackle about communication. So for our discussion, this will be the flow. We will discuss the definition of communication, its purpose in extension, the process, the different elements, the different forms, the different communication barriers, effects, and different models. So, let's start. What is communication? According to Kincaid and Rogers, it is a process in which two or more persons create and share information with one another in order to reach a mutual understanding, mutual agreement, and subsequent collective action. According to Jacobson, communication is a process whereby meanings or ideas are transferred from one person to another. It is a relationship. It is a basic social process based on relationship between two persons or between an individual and a group, group of people. This relationship is based on total understanding of each other relative to some information. Its etymology is communist. It means to make common or establish commonness between two or more people. And communica, that means to share. When we enter a communication situation, we assume that we have something in common with the other person to begin with, a common language, and common symbols whose meanings we share. When we talk about communication, it is important to understand what is the meaning of field of experience. Field of experience is the sum total of an individual's experiences, which influences his or her ability to communicate. Communication take, can take place between people only to the extent that they share a common field of experience or similar experiences. For example, in this figure, we have person A and person B. The circle represents each field of experience. Now, the parts of their circle that intersects with each other are, are their common field of experience. So, in this part of their field of experience, communication can take place. Now, what are the different purposes of communication? We have the following. Communication is concerned with eliciting specific behavioral changes in terms of knowledge or what they know, in terms of attitude, what they feel, and in terms of practice, what they do. For the different functions, we have information, the collection, storage, processing and dissemination of news, data, pictures, facts and messages, opinions and comments needed to enable an individual to understand and react knowledgeably to his environment as well as to make decisions. Another function is socialization. Communication provides a common fund of knowledge which people use in order to operate as effective members of society and to foster social cohesion and awareness so that they will be actively involved in the social life of their community. We also have the function 
of communication, which is motivation. Communication stimulates individual choices, aspirations, and community activities which help achieve the goals of society. Another function of communication is for debate and discussion. Communication provides opportunities for people to exchange facts which are needed to discuss and clarify public issues and to promote greater interest in local, national, and international affairs which are of common concern. We also have the function for education. Communication transmits knowledge that develops intellect character and skills and for cultural promotion communication promotes the development and dissemination of cultural and artistic products of men and preserves them for the future we also have communication to provide entertainment and for integration communication provides the individual and groups access to messages which they need in order to know and understand and appreciate each other. Now, another important definition of communication is that it is a process by which a source sends a message to a receiver by means of a channel to produce a response in accordance with the intention of the source. Now, the key points in this definition is that are the following. Communication is a process that is, consists of five basic elements. And the effectiveness of communication is achieved if the receiver's response matches the intention of the source. Now, Let's talk about communication as interaction. Now, when you say interaction, it is the process of reciprocal road taking, the mutual performance of emphatic behavior. Now, if two individuals make inferences about their own roles and take the role of the other at the same time, and if their communication behavior depends on the reciprocal taking of roles, then they are communicating by interacting with each other. For communication as a process, this stems from the need to change the early notion of communication as a one-way, tap-down transfer of messages from extension workers to farmers. Now, communication should be viewed as a two-way, multidimensional, and interactional activity. Now, let's discuss the different attributes of communication as a process. One attribute of communication is that it is dynamic. It has an ever-changing character. And it fluctuates con constantly, is never fixed, and has no clear beginnings and endings. It is also systemic and should be recognized as a system that consists of a group of elements which interact each other and the system. Another attribute is that it's interaction through symbols. Symbols should arouse in oneself what it arouses in another. The language or symbol we select and the way in which we organize them affect how others will interpret our messages. And meanings are personally constructed. No two people construct the same meaning, even if they hear or see the same thing. 
Interpretation is bounded by our experiences, thoughts, feelings, needs, expectations, self-concept, and knowledge. And each of us is unique, so we interpret in unique ways. Now, let's discuss the basic elements of communication. One of the basic elements of communication is what we call the source. It refers to the person or persons whose ideas or meanings are to be transferred to another person or persons where, or where ideas come from. Now, the characteristics of the source depends on his or her credibility, homophily, and empathy. The credibility of the source is based on four dimensions, which are the character, the composure, competence, and dynamism. When you say credibility, it's the receiver's perception of the believability of the source in a particular situation. Now, credibility is high or low according to the degree to which a source is considered by the receiver as believable in a given situation based on four dimensions as mentioned earlier. Now, when a source is perceived as honest, trustworthy, friendly, reliable, peasant, warm, etc., his or her credibility is based on the character dimension. And when a source is perceived in terms of self-confidence, poise, dignity, level-headedness, etc., his or her credibility is based on the composure dimension. Now, for another dimension, we have competence. Now, when a source is perceived as well-trained, competent, intelligent, experienced, witty, and bright, his or her credibility is based on the competency dimension. And when a receiver rates the source in terms of being bold, aggressive, extrovert, etc., his or her credibility is based on the dynamism dimension. Now, when you say homophily, it refers to the degree to which a receiver perceives the source as similar to him or her in certain attributes such as age, sex, language, regional background, beliefs, values, etc. Homophily of the source and receiver in certain attributes contributes to, the, to effective communication. And we also have to be familiar with what we call empathy. Oh, empathy, it means the ability to put oneself in another person's place. It helps to predict how the receiver will react to the message. So it is very important that the source of the message is have the ability to empathize to, to his or her receiver. Now, another basic element of communication is the receiver. Okay, When you say receiver, it refers to the person or persons for whom the information is intended. Now, when we talk about the characteristics of the receiver, we have to be familiar with different selective processes. And these are the four. We have selective perception, exposure, retention, and selective discussion. Now, selective exposure, it is the tendency for receivers to expose her or himself only to information that agrees with or supports his or her existing behavior. And research shows that when an individual holds two or more cognitions, 
for example, beliefs, behaviors, attitudes that contradict each other, she or he will feel some kind of cognitive dissonance or psychological discomfort and will therefore attempt to remove the dissonance. On the other hand, selective perception is the tendency for receivers to notice or assign meaning only to messages that serve some immediate purpose, reinforce his or her mood, fits his or her cognitive structure, and are meaningful for him or her. You also have the selective retention. Receivers tend to learn or remember only information that supports or agrees with his or her attitude, beliefs, and behaviors. And last but not the least is selective discussion. The receivers tend to discuss only those information which might be of interest to them and to their listeners. When we talk about the characteristics of the source and receiver that determines communication effectiveness, we are talking about the following. First is, of course, the communication skills. The source and the receiver should have communication skills or encoding and decoding skills. This includes the speaking, writing, gesturing, listening, reading, and drawing skills. And of course, both, both should have knowledge of the subject matter. Now, the source should have, um, is, is expected to be more knowledgeable on the subject matter than the receiver. But it is also necessary that the receiver should have at least um some information or a clue about the subject matter and of course the source should should have the knowledge about the characteristics of his or her audience and of course the source should have a knowledge of the communication process and another characteristic is the attitude or the predisposition to respond to any situation it can be towards the, the receiver or towards the source towards the subject matter and towards himself so attitude determines communication effectiveness and of course the cultural system and this prescribes for him his role values beliefs attitudes his behavior and the communication pattern. Now, another basic element of communication is the message. When you say message, it is the information that is communicated. It refers to a set of symbols arranged deliberately in certain ways in order to communicate information or meaning. Now, symbol or language refers to any object or mode of conduct or word towards which humans act as if it were something else. And anything that has meaning is a symbol. And these or symbols used to represent or stand for whatever it is that people agree they should stand for. There are different factors that determine the message. You have the code, the content, and the treatment. Code refers to the symbols or language used in communicating. Both the sender and the receiver should understand in order to communicate, or should understand the code in order to communicate. For the content, it is the idea or substance for example, technology or innovation that is selected to express the purpose of the source for communicating. And for the treatment, 
It is how the materials are arranged, presented, organized in order to be meaningful to the receiver. We also have what we call message appeals. It refers to the motive to which the message is directed. It is the motive or the reason which the source thinks will drive the receiver to pay attention to the message and to accept the idea or product it promotes. There are different forms of appeals. We have patriotism, religion, reward, and fear. Now, what is meaning? The participants of the communication must have the same meaning for the code they use if they are to understand and communicate with each other. Meanings are learned and acquired from experience. We have different dimensions of meaning. We have the denotative or referential meaning, which refers to the relationship between a word sign and an object or the sign object relationship. It is a direct or dictionary meaning. We also have connotative meaning in which meanings are associated with the personal experiences of the person using the word, what they suggest. Therefore, it is figurative. If denotative is, has a dictionary or direct meaning, connotative has a subjective or figurative meaning. Meanings are in people. Meanings are never fixed. As experience changes, meaning changes. No two people can have exactly the same meanings to the extent that they have the same experiences. Another basic element of communication is the feedback. It is the information that is sent or fed back by the receiver intentionally or unintentionally to the source. It serves as a corrective function by preventing communication breakdown. Moreover, it determines whether a message was perceived as intended, and if not, adaptations or modifications in the message or the message channel should be made. It is an important element of effective communication that makes it a two-way process. If a former is viewed as the receiver, then he must be given opportunity to function as the sender or the source with the extension worker as the receiver. In the absence of any reaction from the former, it is virtually impossible to gauge the appropriateness of the message content or the channel that was used in the implementation of an information campaign. Now, there are different types of feedback or response. We have the cognitive effect, the knowledge, awareness, the thought, and the skills. We also have the neutralization or shifting of an existing attitude to the neutral zone. We also have the boomerang effect, a shift opposite to the direction that is intended. And conservation or maintenance of the existing attitude. Last but not the least basic element of communication is the channel. Channel is the way information is communicated. It is the medium or means by which a message travels between a source and a receiver. There are different modes of encoding or decoding so that a message can be seen, heard, touched or felt, smelled, and taste it. Message vehicles are the following. It can be in the form of interpersonal channels, mediated channels, mass media channels, and folk media channels. Among the different uh, forms of message vehicles, let's focus on interpersonal channels. When we say interpersonal channels, it is concerned with face-to-face -face interaction between people. 
Each person assumes the roles of both sender and receiver of messages. In interpersonal channels, the feedback is immediate. And participants may use nonverbal cues to reinforce the meaning. And also in this channel, communication situation is unstructured. In interpersonal channel, there is someone we call the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is the one who controls the flow of information, the one who decides what information to transmit and to whom he will transmit it, evaluates the content to determine its relevance and value to the pot potential receivers, and also has the power to delete, alter the flow, add, subtract, or distort the message. We also have what we call the opinion leader. It is a person who is approached by the others for advice on certain matters. Mm, opinion leaders are perceived as credible, influential, and authoritative in the community. Okay, so now let us briefly discuss the different forms of communication. There are two basic forms of communication. We have the verbal and the nonverbal. For verbal communication, it includes the oral and the written communication. For nonverbal, it includes the sign language, the body language, para language, space, surrounding, time, and also silence. For verbal communication or oral communication, we will briefly discuss the following. The advantages of oral communication, the situations, the disadvantages for oral communication, and some elements or essentials to make an effective oral communication. Now, these are the advantages of oral communication. In oral communication, there is immediate feedback okay the source and the receiver is having for example a face-to-face -face communication or online communication or through phone co communication now this situation gives it the chance to have an immediate feedback it is also time saving it is economical it is, uh, it has personal touch. It has the flexibility. Anytime you are available, you can do the communication. And also it involves secrecy. For example, if uh, the topic you will be talking about needs uh, privacy or secrecy, and of course, if there is an immediate feedback, there is an immediate clarification. And also, this uh, kind of uh, oral of communication can Im can be done also within with a group or within a group. Now, these are the situations for all communication. We have the face to face. Well, aside from the voice. Communication is made through gesture and posture also. We also have the public speaking through phone or mobile phones, through presentation, through radio, through interview, and of course, meeting. Now, there are also disadvantages of oral communication, such as the poor attention. Sometimes there is no record. It is time consuming. Um, there can be also some misunderstanding. It involves lengthy messages, the lack of responsibility, uh, imprecise, and of course, the distance factor. These are the elements or essentials to make an effective oral communication. It should have clarity, precision, should be able to to uh, convey the right words, understand the listener, should uh, use natural voice, 
logical sequence, have a logical sequence, and of course, conviction. For the written communication, we will discuss the following uh, characteristics, situation, its advantages and disadvantages. For the characteristics, it is a creative and conscious activity. It is time-consuming, there is lack of continuity, it demands precision because it is written, and the length of message will depend on, on what message you want to convey. Written communication is involved by uh, using of the memorandums, noticed, uh, circulars, minutes, and letters. The advantages of written communication is that it has a wide access, can be used as a repeated reference, it helps in control, can be used as a legal evidence, it has a fixed responsibility. You will have the precision and accuracy, the mechanical efficiency, you will have a permanent record, and you can convey lengthy messages all at once, and of course, the convenience. However, the disadvantages is it is time consuming. For example, uh, you have to write a lot of information for for the message to be clearly interpreted or uh, accepted by the receiver. It is costly because you will need uh, you, you will need resources to write down your message. There is lack of secrecy because there is record. Um, there is the rigidity. Um, some people might be able to uh, interpret the message in a different way. It is impersonal. It is a delayed feedback and therefore delayed clarification. For nonverbal communication, this, in, this include what we call the sign language. Sign language involves audio signals or the sound signals. It also involves visual signals or the combination of both audio-visual communication. Now for the audio or sound signals, these are some examples. Drum beating, fire alarm, buzzer, clock alarm, electric bell, and the likes. So this um type of communication convey the message very quickly and is very useful for time management for example your the clock alarms it it can easily it can easily say that oh i need to wake up at this time because the clock alarm so those kind oh this kind of uh, communication can convey messages very quickly. We also have the visual signals. Visual signals include facial expressions, printed pictures, posters, slides, film, cartoons, maps, flags, flowers, and etc. Now, in this type of communication, no words are uttered, no signs are made, and yet the message gets across effectively. Of course, visual communication alone is not always enough, but it can be useful to communicate very simple ideas. So these are the advantages of visual signals. It can convey the message very easily and economically. It can make the communication interesting and motivating. It reflects the mental makeup and cultural background of the communicator. It is useful for informing and educating illiterate people and can be used as an effective means of advertisement. Now for the combination of audio and visual or audio visual communication, this is very useful for oral and written words. It is a powerful measure of communication and cinema screens and video tapes. And uh, this type of communication is the one that is most suitable for mass mass publicity. 
There are dis disadvantages of sign language, or disadvantages of the tree. Of course, a great amount of skill and effort is required to draw effective pictures and cartoons on a poster. Only simple and elementary ideas can be communicated. This is only a supplement to verbal communication, and it may be understood sometimes. And uh, on-the-spot correction is not possible. Now let's talk about the body language, another form of nonverbal communication. This includes the face, head, and the eyes. For example, the gesture or movements of body parts, the body shape and the posture. You can be standing or sitting erect, you can be leaning forward or backward. Now, this type of body languages have different meanings, right? It can convey you different messages. This one could be confidence. This might be defensive. This one is openness. This one is cooperation. Now take a look on these different uh, shapes and postures. So this body shapes, uh, body shape and postures, different postures can mean different meanings. So all of this has different meanings depending on the sender and of course how will be or how will the receiver receive the message. All right, so another form of nonverbal communication is the para language. When you say para, it means like a language. It, um, it includes the quality of the voice, sound, accent, and stress. It is the nonverbal aspects of the spoken words. Okay, it includes of course, the voice, the word stress, and later on, we'll discuss its advantages and disadvantages. For the voice, there is um, variation in terms of speaking speed. Different speaking speed can convey meaning, can convey different meanings. And of course, it includes pitch variation, volume variation, pause and space fillers, like the, uh, okay, oh, you see. Oh, those are examples of paralanguage, voice paralanguage. In terms of word stress, so take a look at this similar or three similar sentences but conveys different meanings depending on where you put the stress. For example, are you going to the market? So the source is asking the receiver whether he or she or someone else is going to the market. Next example is, are you going to the market? The sender or the source is asking the receiver if he will go, he or she will go to the market. Okay. Are you going? Going now or later? Or later? Going or not going? Are you going to the market? The sender is asking the receiver if he or she is going to the market or some other place. Okay. So see the effect of word stress in this in this kind of a uh, question. Now the advantages of para language are the following: no oral communication is complete without para language. 
and speaker's education background can be known. It indicates person's place in hierarchical structure. And the knowledge of prior language helps in dealing with others. And prior language can be improved by listening to good speaker. However, there are also disadvantages. It is like a language, but not a language. Therefore, it can be relied fully. Unless the listener is open-minded, it may prejudice him. And as speakers belong to different speech communities, uniformity becomes difficult. We also have what we call the space or proxemics. can be intimate, personal, social, or public. For intimate space language, these are the characteristics. It is a space of 18 inches between the receiver and the sender. It is suitable for body language. It involves the family members, relatives, and close friends. It is suitable for highly confidential talks. Um, it involves handshakes, a pat on the back, Eye contact. So these are the some of the gestures that gestures that is commonly used or are commonly used in this zone. You also have the personal space language. The space extends from eighteen to inch in eighteen inches to four feet. This in, can include normal conversation with close friends and colleagues. It is largely personal, but relaxed, and it is casual. And this is where important decisions can be taken. We also have the social space language, and the space is from 4 feet to 12 feet. This is for formal and official relationship, and most of the business communication is in this zone. It is done by reason and planning and emotions and feelings and last but not the least is the public space language it extends beyond 12 feet it is highly formal and objective it involves public announcements elections rallies etc and high pitch of voice is used for larger group you also have the surroundings the colors, the layout and design involves in here. Time language, the different time saving devices in the office. Silence, silence could mean disapproval, anger, lack of interest. Another is pause before and after a speech. This indicates that. Maybe the sender is thinking about something or thinking deeply about the subject. So that is all for this lecture. I hope you learned something. Thank you very much again and I'll see you next time.